trouble. Trouble, whatever form it takes, will find you. You know that, right? <laughs> trouble has a way of finding us. And when it does, when it does, anxiety, pain, and sorrow come with it. Some of you may be right in the very thick of it right this morning as I speak. You know what trouble is all about. So when I was thinking about this this week, I realized that when trouble finds you and your heart is broken and aching <clears throat> and you long for a word of comfort, you long for a comforting, a soothing, an encouraging word, let me ask you, where do you normally turn to? I dare say that most of us turn to a loved one. Or we turn to a very close friend. But invariably, invariably, we will turn to the Word of God, the Bible. That's right. That's right, my sister. That's exactly right. By the way, did you by any chance catch the words of the second stanza of the hymn that we sang this morning for an opener. Now, I know that sometimes we sing the hymns and, you know, the words just kind of fly over our heads and we don't pay a whole lot of attention to them. We kind of sing them out of road. But I was hoping that perhaps you were listening carefully to that hymn. We haven't sung that hymn in a long time. Give me the Bible. And I want you to notice if you will. Here, we have them right here. Look at it. Isn't that wonderful? Give me the, read them with me, would you please? Read, let's read together in unison. Give me the Bible. When my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear, give me the precious words by Jesus spoken. Hold up faith's lamp to show my Savior near. I don't know. Did you catch that when you were singing that this morning? It's easy to kind of miss, isn't it? This is why I believe that worship is a, is a total thing. When we come to worship, we, we got to listen to the songs that we sing when we praise God through the praise music. We got to listen to the hymns that we sing because God has a message. I don't, when, I, when I read those words this week again, I said, wow, give me the Bible. Lord, sometimes our hearts are broken and we need a word of encouragement from someone. Give me the Bible. The Bible is God's word for every occasion, especially, especially in troublous times. Hmm. But I want to tell you about another source. I want to tell you about another source of comfort that sometimes we overlook. We, we, we don't, we try not to overlook it in the worship service, but that other source of comfort, my friends, is the church hymnal. The hymns that we sing. It's another source of comfort. The hymnal. When you are sad, the words of an old familiar hymn can bring somehow a sense of soothing, a sense of strength to a grieving heart. There must be some hymns that you know so well. For example, for me, what a friend we have in Jesus. It's an old one, but... It works for me when I need it. Amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. These are hymns that, that bring soothing. And so the Bible and the hymnal are wonderful sources that God has given to us. When we're sad. When trouble has knocked at your door. I want to speak to you this morning about an old familiar hymn that I have really loved through the years. We don't sing it very often, but we're going to sing it today at the end of the service. It's found in our hymnal. But as I read it carefully, I also realize that it's only a paraphrase. It is only a paraphrase 
of the original hymn. That's right. You see, the original hymn is found in the world's oldest hymnal. Uh, do you know what the world's oldest hymnal is? Uh, young people, do you know? The Psalms. That's right. The book of Psalms is the world's oldest hymn. We know that the book of Psalms uh, were written in songs and, and also in poetry and also in, in hymns. They were the hymns. In fact, listen to this. In fact, the early church, those early Christians, first and second century, way back then, they used the Psalms as their first hymnal. First church hymnal. And therefore, I go to the Psalms quite a bit. I wish we still had the music to some of those old, old Psalms that they sang way back there. I don't know what they sounded like, Wilney, but maybe they sound a little strange to us today. But I tell you what, those words are still powerful. And you know one of my favorite, one of my favorite hymns that I find in the old hymnal, uh, the Psalms, one of my favorite hymns there is Psalms 46. It's a beautiful hymn. It's a lovely hymn. Psalms 46. Take your Bibles and open to that psalm, if you will, with me. Psalms 46. I want you to look at the first verse. That first verse really speaks to my heart. God is our refuge and strength. Wow, it could put a period right there and that would be sufficient for me. God is my refuge. We're gonna talk about that this morning. God is my refuge. He is a very present help in trouble. And so as I read the 46th hymn of the Psalms, I realize that Psalms 46 is specifically for people in trouble. For people in trouble. If you are in trouble and need words of comfort, if you are in trouble and need the assurance that God is with you in your trouble right now, this is your song. It's beautiful. It's comforting. It's powerful. It's reassuring. I want you to read it and to read it often, hopefully after today. And if need be, you ought to perhaps even memorize it. God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In fact, I have learned in not that long ago, I learned that this psalm was Martin Luther's psalm. You have heard of Martin Luther, the great reformer who started the great reformation. This was Martin Luther's psalm. When the great reformer was beset with troubles, when the people were after him, I don't, have, I don't know if you've ever seen the film, Martin Luther. If you haven't seen, if you, haven't, you can go to and, and rent it, I'm sure, at the video store. It's, it's a powerful film. When he was beset, he was besieged by all kinds of criticism and problems, and he was up to his ears and troubles. He would often refer to Psalms 46. He would keep coming back to it again and again. In fact, he would tell his friends that were all around him, he says, this is the Psalms that buoys me up in my needs and in my trouble. And then he would call his friend, his best friend was a guy by the name of Philip Melanchthon, and he would say, Philip, come and let's sing Psalms 46. Martin Luther wanted to make Psalms 46 your psalm as well. So you know what he did? You know what he did. He paraphrased it and put it to music. And that's what we're going to be singing later on today. The mighty fortress is our God. He did that way back in 1529, a long time ago. And so the song's been around, this hymn has been around for a long time. In fact, I also read this week that John Wesley, one of the great Methodist reformers, 
When he was just about ready to die, the night before he died, he had someone bring his Bible to him and he read Psalms 46. And all through the night, as he was slowly ebbing away, his life was slowly ebbing away, he kept repeating over and over again, God is my refuge and strength. A very present time. Help in trouble. So I find that this psalm has been a blessing to many. I find, I'm not a, I'm not a musician by any means, but as I, I can read commentaries, and uh, Brandon, so we have many musicians here, and I know, I understand that this psalm is divided into, this song, I should say, is divided into three stanzas. Uh, the first stanza is verses one to three, and the second stanza is verses four through seven, and the third stanza is verses 8 through 11. So we want to look at those verses briefly here this morning. Look at verse, look at the first stanza with me. Hopefully you got your Bibles open there. Just give me a moment here. This is why I don't like to have my hands tied, but that's okay. Look at Psalms 46. The first stanza, verses 1, 2, 3, through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters, its waters roar and be troubled, Though the mountains shake and, and it's swelling. And let's just stop there. There's a pause there. That's what that little word. There's a pause there. Um, as I was reading this psalm, I said, what's the point of this first stanza? Listen, my friends. The point of this very first stanza is very simple. The point is this. You can remain calm in the midst of trouble when God is present. I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice what God does and does not promise in this verse. God does not promise to prevent trouble. Rather, he promises to be present when trouble comes. <clears throat> it's right there in verse 1. A very present help in trouble. We don't have it on the screen. It's okay. Now, I, I, I don't know. Just like you, some of us would like to believe that the Christian is calm because there's no trouble when we have accepted God. <laughs> the Christian feels that they should, everything should be calm when you, once you accept God and you know that God is present in your life. That's not what God has promised. Experience has taught us that. <clears throat> What the psalm is telling us is that God is not, is not telling us that, that, that God prevents trouble, no, but that he promises to be present whenever trouble comes. A few examples of that, as you know so well, the three Hebrews who were thrown into the furnace. Daniel, who was thrown to the lion's den. <clears throat> Joseph who was sold by his brothers and thrown into a pit and lied about and accused by a woman of raping her. Joseph, who was thrown into prison for that very same thing. All through that time, they must have been wondering, God, where are you? Where is the promise of this text? But they didn't do that, my friends, because they realized that God was with them in the very midst of all of that. And I ask myself the question, well, if God doesn't deliver me the way he delivered those guys, does that mean he's not with me? What difference does it make then for his presence to be with me if I'm not delivered miraculously like they were? And so I thought about that. 
Some of you are sweating. Well, yeah, Pastor, what difference does it make? What difference does God's presence in my life make if I don't receive the same kind of deliverance? My friends, you, if you haven't found this out already, you will. And here it is. It gives the presence of God gives strength, the strength needed to endure the hardship. The presence of God sustains in ways that we cannot fully understand. The presence of God brings comfort. The presence of God keeps hope alive. The presence of God steers, stirs within you the conviction that God, not trouble, has the final word. The presence of God reassures you that deliverance, that better days are coming in God's time and in God's way. And so God's presence is so vitally important. And so even though sometimes I don't feel God, I says, Lord, I, I'm not Joseph. He didn't do, oh, you know, or, or Daniel. But Lord, I just thank you for your presence. The psalmist says that in your presence there's fullness of joy. And that at your right hand there's treasures forevermore. So things that I cannot explain to you, I cannot really, you know, define so well. But I know that God's presence makes a big difference. So that's why the psalmist says, God is with you in trouble. And his presence in trouble will give you the sustaining strength and power that you need. Verse 2 and 3. Look at, follow me, follow along with me. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and even though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Wow. In verse 3. Though its waters roar and be troubled. Though the mountains shake with its swelling. That's it. That's verse 3. Mm. That's, 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 that's stanza 1. Excuse me. We will not fear. Thank you, God, for that promise. But I want you to notice something that sometimes we skip in this passage. My friends, if you read it carefully, he is telling you and he's telling me, listen carefully. He is telling you and he's telling me that every human refuge will eventually fail. Where do I get that from? Well, <clears throat> you notice that the psalmist mentions the mountains. Twice he mentions the mountains. I don't know about you, but when I think of mountains, I think I know the mountains are symbolic of all that is stable, enduring, immovable, unshakable. Mountains are not supposed to move. And yet the psalmist is saying to us that your mountains may move. Wow. The question that I have, and I'm sure you have, is what are you going to do when the unmovable moves? What are you going to do when the, when the unshakable shakes? Wow. When, what are you going to, when every physical refuge, every human refuge will eventually fail, that's the picture that the psalmist is trying to tell us here. And as I was reading about this today, this week, I should say, I, I said, I'm no, listen, I'm sure that there are hearts here this morning right here in this room this morning that are aching, hurting. A mountain has moved for you. Some human refuge has failed you. A mountain has moved. The unshakable has shaken. Let me give you a couple examples. We're full of them here. If, you, if we have time, you could all stand up and say, Pastor, this mountain has moved for me. My son or my daughter has turned their backs on God. When all the time that I have spent with them, when all the investments that I have made in their lives, 
bringing them to church ever since they were knee high to a grasshopper. I have done everything I possibly could. Now they have turned their backs on us as their parents. They have turned their backs on God. They want nothing more to do with the church. A mountain has moved. And it hurts. Maybe someone here this morning has just received news this week or maybe in the last few months that you're not going to be as healthy as you once were ever again. It's pretty hard to feel that everything is okay when your body doesn't feel that way. A mountain has moved. Perhaps you have lost your job. Or perhaps you have lost your marriage. Perhaps you have lost your friend, a best friend, a loved one, to death. A mountain has moved. The unshakable, the unthinkable has happened. You know, I, I like to tell this story because years ago, my family, our family and I, we went to New York City for vacation. New York City for vacation. What a place to go. I know, but I, I love the city. I still remember driving downtown, and we drove right to the World Trade Center. That's before 9-11. And I think you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> we drove to the World Trade Center. We got onto one of the towers. We entered one of the towers and we rode the express. They have an express elevator, believe it or not. And it took us way to the very top. It was kind of scary to watch the floors, the, the numbers, you know. You can watch those numbers go and you're going all the way to the heavens almost. We climbed to the very top. And I remember saying, wow, when is this thing ever going to stop? It keeps climbing higher and higher and higher. I remember the story, that reminds me of the story of the little boy that made his visit, first visit to New York City. He had never been to the big city before, and he had never been inside an, a, of an elevator before. He had never been, he'd never been in an airplane before, so his parents took him to the Empire State Building. Have you guys anybody been to Empire State Building? is also kind of neat, too. I think it's got only about 102 floors where the Trade Center had much more than that. Anyways, this little boy is inside the elevator, and he watches, he's standing there, and he's watching the numbers go, bzz, 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 and he comes to the 100th floor, and his ears begin to pop a little bit because, you know, he's getting higher and higher, and he becomes a little frightened, and he turns to his father, and this is an elevator filled with people, and he turns to his father, and he says, Daddy, does God know we're coming? out of the mouth of a little babe. And so the day that I and my family, we went to the very top of the Twin Towers, I too felt that I was on my way to heaven. And I wonder what it would look like when I got there. But as I got up to the top tower, we looked across the city, and you could see into, even into New Jersey, and you could see it was a beautiful scenery, a gorgeous sight. And you know what, friends? The possibility of those buildings collapsing never crossed my mind. Those towers, they tell me that those towers were one of the marvels of modern day engineering. They were solid, they were stable, they were lasting, apparently immovable. But we all know what happened shortly after that, the towers came tumbling down. The immovable moved. And Psalms 46 wants to remind us, listen my friends, Psalms 46 wants to remind you that what seems lasting really isn't. Have you thought about that? Some people think the marriage is going to be lasting forever, but there are many people who tell us, no, that's not true. Some people feel that health goes on, especially when you're young, where health goes on forever. And that's not true because there's many of us who will tell you that health breaks down. Whatever we put our faith into. So the question the psalmist wants to ask, what are you putting your trust in? 
Be careful where you put your trust for the things that appear to last will not. Every human refuge eventually fails. But the psalmist reminds us God does not fail. And that's his promise. God is our refuge and our strength. Now let's, let's read the second stanza. The second stanza, verses 7 through 4 through 7. There is a river, and I love this verse. I love this verse. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just as the break, just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He utters his voice. The earth melted. Hmm. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I love that passage. And I ask, my, what's the point of this stanza in the song? The point of this stanza, my friends, is so vital. Listen, it is that you and I are invincible. And I love that word. Invincible when God is present. When he as is at the very center of life. Now, verse 4. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. You know as well as I know that in the days of David, cities were built around water. Cities were built around a river. Huge walls with a city running through the center of the city. The people wanted a river to run through their city. That way when the army laid siege, the people could hold out perhaps indefinitely because there was water. They needed a river. And if the river was in the midst of the city, no army could keep them from the water. They would remain, they could survive, they would become invincible. But as I study this passage, I say something rather interesting. Jerusalem does not have a river running through it. Was that a mistake that God did? You blew it here, brother. No. Because when you study this psalm carefully, you, you will realize that this, this, the city, or I should say the river, is a symbol for God himself. God is the very source of life. And so the, the river is, is actually, God is the river. When her enemies were all around her, Jerusalem was invincible because God was in her midst. And he's telling us that you and I are invincible so long again as God remains at the center of our lives. Notice verse 4 again. It says it takes, it talks about streams. Streams that come from the city, from that river. And I love that passage because there's streams. These streams flowing from the river to other parts of the city. Streams follow all out of the river to water every other small community throughout the city. You can see the river flowing out into little streams that would water the entire, the entire city. And out under the walls to even help the neighbors who were nearby to water them as well. God is a river of life flowing out of you and me and reaching thirsty souls that are all around us. Hmm. She will not fear. The Lord is in the midst. He is her river. I don't know about you. Do you remember that little chorus that we used to sing long ago? I tried finding the music and I couldn't this week. I was hoping maybe we could sing it, but the little chorus used to go something. I'm not going to sing it, but these are the words. I've got a river of life flowing out of me, makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Open prison doors, sets the captive free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, O oh well, within my soul. Spring up, O oh well, and make me whole. Spring up, O oh well, and give to me that life 
abundantly. And so the river of life that you and I, and I, you going to play that for us? Why are you sitting behind? You want to sing that? Who knows it? You know it? Who knows it? Uh, nobody knows it. All right. Let's just sing it quickly. Those of you who know it. Do you know it? You don't? Okay. I needed to have somebody. Well, then you know it? Come up quickly. His voice is much better than mine. We don't have the words. Hey, we have the words. All right. I've got a river of life. This is the river. God is the river flowing through your life to bless others. Here we go. Let's sing it. Here we go. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up a well within my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me that life abundantly. Thank you, Wilde. Oh, that brings back some nice memories. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. God is that river. God is at the center of your life. Then his life will flow through you. Verse 5 again says, The strength of the holy city was not to be found in her massive walls or fortifications, but the fact that her defense was the ever-present God. I love that verse, she shall not be moved, verse 5, she shall not be moved. And I ask the question, my friends, what is it that we cannot, why is it that we cannot be moved when God is at the center? Why is it, why, why are we invincible? Is it because we're so strong? Is it because we're so clever? Is it because we're so righteous? No, it's because of that river. It's because of the presence of God in your life. I love, years ago I read this from Ministry of Healing, page 182, and I want to share this with you. Ministry of Healing, page 182. Nothing, listen to this words now, nothing is apparently more helpless. Can you identify? Can you put your name there? Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, there's that word that I like, that the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior by prayer, by the study of the, His Word, by faith in His abiding presence, the weakest, the weakest of human beings may live in a, may live, may live in connect, in contact, excuse me, with the living Christ. And He will hold them by a hand that will never let go. Wow. That's that river of life. That flows through us. That's that river of life, my friends. Now let me quickly look at the last verse. The last stanza, I should say. Verses 8 through 11. Come, verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to, end, to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And I ask, beautiful. But what's the picture here? The picture is one of a battle that's been fought and won. The victory has been won. God has broken every single weapon of the enemy that the enemy has used against his people all through history, and he's doing it again. That's good news. And so you see, I don't care how many troubles the enemy may throw at you, my friends. God has an answer for every one of them. He breaks the bow. He cuts the spear. He burns the chariot. The battle is his. But I forget that. And I dare say so to you. Sometimes in the very midst of trouble, we forget 
the good things that God has done in our lives. We forget that the battle has already been won. We see only the bad things that are happening to us. And I'm, asked, I'm saying to you is the same sermon I'm preaching. Listen, my friends, unless, unless we see God when things are good, how in the world are we going to believe that God is good when things are bad? And so the psalmist is saying to us, listen, praise God when things are good. When health is good. When the table is full. When the loved ones are nearby. Praise God for the battles won. And you will believe he is good when the time is bad. Wow, what a lesson. Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Hello. We're not very good at that. I dare say that some of us are so busy, some of you here this morning, some of us are, are so busy that we don't know the meaning of being still before the Lord, before his open word on our knees. There's too much going on in our lives at times for us to practice the presence of God. Some of us may be sure that he is in our midst even when we don't practice his presence. We just take it for granted. And that's not something you can take for granted. I think you are taking God for granted if you're not taking time to be still before him and to know that he is God. You may be too busy making a living. You may be too busy getting an education. You may be too busy working for the Lord. Mm. You do not know what it means to be still and to know that he is God. And so trouble swallows you up. You can't handle it because God is not there to handle it with you. You know, I heard something strange some years ago. And <laughs> I haven't seen anything like that. But I heard that one time, you know those big tankers, gas, gasoline tankers that they go around filling up all the gas stations in town? You've seen them. Esso and all those people. Well, one of these huge tankers was seen on the side of the road out of gas. <laughs> you know? Uh, and and when, when I read the story, I, re I read that this guy, the driver of that tanker was so busy, he was busy going all around town, making sure that all the gas stations had plenty of gas, that he never stopped to check his own gas gauge. Irony. So there he was sitting without no gas. He had given, he had given, and he had given until suddenly he had nothing more to give. And that can happen to caretakers, that can happen to parents, that can happen to students, that can happen to church leaders. We can give, 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 give and forget that our own spiritual reservoir is dangerously low. And so the psalmist wants to remind us of that. Be still and know that I am God. Take time. Forget everything else. And so the grand climax, listen to it, the grand climax of Psalms 46 is found in verse 7 and 11. He repeats himself, verse 7, look at verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. He's getting a message across. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Most of us do not appreciate a refuge. That is a place of safety until there is a storm. When the weather is beautiful and the sea is calm, the ships are sailed gaily by the harbor. But the moment a storm breaks, everybody heads for the refuge. And so I'm saying to you this morning as I'm saying to myself, listen, my friends, maybe, just maybe, instead of worrying about those troubles that seem so bad, that come now and then, maybe we ought to be thankful for those troubles that come. 
Maybe, just maybe, the Lord could use those troubles to lead us to the refuge. Himself. So if God is your refuge and strength, no amount of troubles can shake you out of his hand. Isn't that a marvel, marvel? So in the end of time, listen, I was reading this work this week in the, in the SDA Bible commentary. The SDA Bible commentary, if you ever read it, read it on this passage. At the very end, it says that at the end of time, in a time of trouble, this very psalm, Psalms 46, is going to be the psalm of God's people. They're going to be memorized. They're going to be singing it because they're going to understand the whole concept of God being with them. And I'm going to leave you this morning with just not a psalm, but a passage from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. He had the same message, and this is his message. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. The mountains shall depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. God is your refuge. He is your strength in trouble. Please stand with me as we sing our closing hymn number 506, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Kingdom.
gracious Father, this morning, we have been encouraged by your word. Your word is powerful, Lord, and we thank you for that. We claim your promise today. We're going to live on that promise that you are our refuge and strength. Let us remember that when trouble comes, and for those who may be right in the very midst of it right now, may they realize that you are with them in that trouble and that you are going to provide, you're going to sustain them through that trouble. You're going to provide the strength that is needed, the courage that is needed, the comfort that is needed. And then in your, in your own time and in your own way, you will bring deliverance and you will bring better days. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>